good evening, depending on where you are in the world. Thanks very much for joining us this evening at, the, at this conference about the importance of beekeepers and the public in monitoring of non-Indigenous species with Dr. Yovana Villa Dubayage, who is Assistant Professor of the Institute of Zoology in the Faculty of Biology at the University of Belgrade. My name is John Park. I'm your host for this evening. This evening event is part of the conference series called Bees Without Borders that was first launched on the 21st of November, 2020, where we had an all day event online, of course, to talk about the importance of cavities in trees, the organisms that live within it, and their relationships with honeybees. Since 2022, this conference series has been continued with monthly meetings. This conference series is led by Free the Bees Switzerland in collaboration with Apis Arborea in California, the Natural Beekeeping Trust in the UK, and Honeybee Wild in Luxembourg. We want to use these, uh, this uh, event series as an international platform for researchers, practitioners, and enthusiasts like you to talk about subjects related to honeybee ecologies and honeybees relationship and role with wild pollinator species. If you have ideas for speakers and or subjects, then we invite you to provide your ideas through the questionnaire that you will receive after this event. I am one of the volunteers of Honeybee Wild in Luxembourg, uh, whose mission is to support and study honeybees living in uh, cavities such as in trees and buildings that are living without human intervention. We refer to them as free living bees. We are currently monitoring about 50 honeybee nests. I am also a volunteer of the Luxembourg Pollinator Mon Monitoring Scheme, where the abundance of butterfly species and bumblebee morpho species are counted, and insect species in pan traps are also counted. These are part of larger EU or European Union monitoring schemes for pollinators. The results of these monitoring activities are of, are of course impacted by invasive alien species. In the EU, there are 176 of these species, 147 of them are present in Luxembourg. 21 of them are on the blacklist, which means that they have a high spread potential and they damage either biodiversity, health and or the economy. The Asian hornet is an example of such a species that has been present in Luxembourg since September 2020, and it's been confirmed as nesting in Luxembourg as of 2022. While the Asian hornet is not on the blacklist in Luxembourg, its potential damage to wild native pollinators in Luxembourg could be very large. The sculptured resin bee is not yet present in Luxembourg, but is very close to our borders at about 160 kilometers or 100 miles away. Therefore, this is a species we need to keep an eye on. We are very pleased to welcome Giovanna this evening to talk about these invasive alien species, such as the sculptured resin bee and the Asian hornet. Among her many activities, she was a speaker at the Learning from the Bees Conference in England in April 2023, and at the Honey Bee Watches uh, conference on uh, monitoring protocols regarding her team's research on wild honeybees living in uh, Belgrade. You can find links to her work through the QR code that's currently on the screen. As you will see on the agenda, Joanna has about 60 minutes to present and after which we'll have about 20 minutes for questions and a few minutes for me to close. Uh, note that Giovanna may have an interruption uh, during her presentation for an unforeseen uh, event. So we might have a pause for uh, up to five minutes, let's say. As we're quite a few uh, participants this evening, we ask you to uh, ask your questions after her presentation and to ask them by clicking on reactions and then raise hand. Or if that is difficult, then just unmute your mic and ask your question uh, directly. We would prefer not to have questions in the chat, as this will probably be quite difficult to manage with a large group. With that, I ask uh, Yovana to start sharing your presentation. Thank you. 
Thank you, John. Uh, yes, I will share my presentation. Uh, you all heard my name. I come from Serbia, Belgrade, University of Belgrade. Belgrade. Um, can you see my presentation now? I will just put it in a... Yes, do, do you see it? Can you hear me well? Yes, great. Yes, looks good. So, yeah, I, I work as an assistant professor at the biology faculty. And uh, today I really would like to um, talk about, for me, this is really interesting topic. Uh, I also put my contacts here and John also shared them. If you have any questions even later after the lecture, feel free to, um, to send me an email or reach out. So, uh, like this, this species that we just by accident started to study because it appeared in, in Serbia, um, it's called Megahila sculpturalis. This is the, the scientific name. Um, mostly people call it sculptured resin bee. Uh, before it was called um, giant resin bee, but it's not really adequate because um, in Asia, where it comes from, it's not really giant. So it's uh, it's pretty um, like it's pretty unique in bee fauna if you consider Europe, right? And today, as you all uh, probably read when you um, uh, apply to listen to this lecture, these will be the questions I will answer, and I will like to discuss more uh, later um, during the question uh, period of the lecture. So first of all, I just want briefly to tell you a little bit about this species. It belongs to a family of bees called Megahilide, uh, subgenus Calomegahile, which is not that important. I just want to share that uh, uh, this is one of the species from this subgenus that it's uh, not strictly uh, spread in tropical zone. So it's actually subtropical which is probably why it, it, uh, it's so successful in Europe, as we will see. Uh, the, native, uh, the native range uh, is actually from Taiwan through eastern China and Korea. This is the native range. So if you, like I said, it's really, um, in Europe there are few large bees, there are few dark bees. But uh, if you look at certain details of Megahila sculpturalis, you will see it's pretty unique. You, if I'll, I'll tell you now what are the details you should look for, and you will not make a mistake when trying to figure out what are you looking at. Uh, first of all, males and females are quite uh, different, as in many other bees. Females are, uh, first of all, much larger. They are, of uh, really huge, uh, sometimes even up to three centimeters. Uh, males are quite smaller. Here on this photo, you can see the comparison to honeybee, just to see that how, how big this bee is. Um, uh, other differences between males and females, I want to, to show you. Uh, it's actually, um, when you look at the face of this bee, uh, males have this uh, really distinctive like yellowish hairs on its face. We, we like to joke it's kind of a mustache, but uh, I mean, joke aside, it's really uh, the thing you, you will easily recognize when you look at this bee, while females have this black face. Uh, so you, you can, um, uh, males and females are really easy to distinguish. There's another thing, uh, if, you, if you look at this bee, from side or from above, uh, sorry, from, from uh, if you look at its belly, uh, females have, I have this picture here I wanted to show you, a female have this uh, distinctive uh, uh, hairs on its belly, it's scientifically called scopa, and it serves a pretty important purpose, you know, that bees collect pollen to feed uh, their offspring, and usually bees carry pollen on their legs. But this bee, as other uh, bees uh, from this family, actually collect and carry pollen on their bellies. So if you compare male and female, we know that males don't uh, help females uh, in collecting pollen for the offspring. 
so they don't have this hair but uh, females have this is like a brush like structure on the abdomen also sometimes when you observe uh, bees uh, uh, foraging uh, sometimes you will not see this this hair because it will be filled with pollen uh, so uh, if you see this yellow things uh, on, on her belly it's just just pollen so before uh, before i continue um <clears throat> Uh, telling you about this particular species, how we found it uh, in Serbia and what was going on with monitoring. I really would like to uh, tell you more about this terminology that you can see on the screen. What exactly is native species? Like everybody heard this term, native, non-native. But what does it mean? And when I explain that, I want to explain the term invasive because it's really important since different authors, different scientists actually use this uh, term in a different ways. And I will like, explain that also. So native species, it's, it's uh, essentially it's the one that either evolved in a particular area or has uh, naturally expanded its range, you know, without any human influence or, or intervention. So this is what we call native species. So no native is the other way around, something that is introduced in a certain area, uh, not naturally. So with a, usually with the help of people. And we know that uh, throughout history, humans have displaced many, many species uh, from their natu natural habitats. Sometimes it's, uh, uh, it was uh, intentional, as we know, uh, decades ago, it was sometimes really intentional and sometimes it's really just by accident. We don't even realize we are transferring organisms around the globe. So this uh, method of, of, of dispersal is, uh, is it a natural process or human uh, assisted process? It's a huge difference because uh, we know in biology that uh, every population, every species has this tendency to spread. But the, the rate, the, 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 how fast it can spread, it's really different when, when people are involved and, and when the species is doing it by, by its natural ways. So now that we explained uh, what is native and non-native, what, what is invasive now? This is really confusing for some people. Because the scientists are also confused with this. Uh, some scientists um, actually consider this term as every species that is not native and it spreads really fast, they call it invasive. But there's another point of view, which is, uh, well, actually my point of view, it's not enough. Uh, it, it's not that, let's not jump into conclusions. Let's not call every non-native species invasive. So what makes a species invasive? It has to have um, measurable negative impact on native species and ecosystems. So it's not just, oh, we observe this negative behavior. No, we need to measure it. We need to research it and say this and this has significant measurable negative impact on native species. So I just really wanted to just briefly explain this before I um, go further to the uh, to the Megahelis culturalis. Um, why? Why is this important? Like when you say invasive species, everybody thinks of something really horrible, bad, etc. And then when you say a bee can be invasive, it's also very confusing because we generally have this positive perception, you know, that the so, uh, when you say bees, it's usually this positive thinking, right? Uh, so we know that the bees are really important pollinators, and we don't even think that any negative things can go along with them, but, uh, but there are, and, and this is really important. First of all, um, non-native bees, they can really compete for resources with um, a native bees. 
And when I say resources, it could be for food or nesting resources or other materials. Uh, we could have a situation like uh, there is this new bee that bring new pathogens, new parasites. It could be a really problematic. Then something we in science, we call this disruption of pollinator networks. This is kind of complicated to explain, but uh, let's think about it like this. Uh, every ecosystem has its balance, has its, you know, uh, things that uh, are in balance within. And if you inter introduce another, just all of a the sudden, there's something new. Of course, it will interrupt. It will, it will break this balance. So there's something we call um, plant pollinator networks. And the new bee species can really interrupt this. So that, that's another potential negative impact. Uh, also, something that maybe not everybody would think of, but uh, non-native bees can really help uh, pollinate non-native invasive plants. And in my opinion, this is the, the most important part. And we, we will come to that. So these are all the negative impacts that are potentially there. We just need to see. We, we don't want to jump into conclusions, but we need to research it and, and then give our conclusions. So um, there's there's our V again, Megahelis culturalis. We see her native range. Uh, on this map, you can see that uh, it was the first um, detected outside its native range in North America in 1994. Uh, in Europe, it was first detected in 2008. And of course, we don't know uh, if, I mean, we are now talking about Europe, first of all. Uh, for Europe, we are not sure if it came from its native range or from, you know, secondary range, North America, or both. It could also be like uh, different uh, multiple introductions. We don't know this. Uh, what we, but, how do we explain this, these introductions? It's not really uh, hard to imagine these scenarios if we know the life cycle of this bee. I'm not going to bore you with too many details, but I will just say that there is this, this bee nests in, uh, in, in pre-existing pre holes and cavities inside, wooden mater inside different materials, but mostly it's wooden material. And it's really has a long hi hibernation period, this dormant period. And it's really easily, you just import some wooden packaging, bamboo stamps, whatever. You imported the nests of this bee. You didn't even realize you did it, but you did. So, yeah, it's really easy to imagine uh, even this scenario of, of multiple introductions. So now we come to these, these questions that I uh, so often uh, have, like this is the questions that uh, people always ask, uh, you know, for a good reason. Will this species affect uh, honeybees? Will it affect uh, native solitary bees? What will happen with, you know, floral resources? Will it limit uh, floral resources for, for resources for other pollinators? And uh, the, uh, to answer this question, I divided it because it's different answer for honeybees and for other bees. Uh, uh, the short answer is for honeybees, it's no, don't worry. It will most definitely not affect honeybees in any way. And I'll explain why. Um, first of all, they, are com they have completely different life cycles. They are complete, like the cavities even honeybees in nature, the cavities they search for, they like, uh, uh, it's totally different than, than uh, what Megahelis culturalis is, is looking for. That, that's the first thing. So uh, the nesting cavities are completely different. Megahelis culturalis is, uh, first of all, solitary bee that is active only for about two months during the year, while honeybees are as we know, social in insects, they're active throughout the year. So it's a to totally different thing. Uh, and third, like many beekeepers ask me, 
is mega healers culturalis attracted to honey will there be test uh, scenarios and stuff no it's not at all attracted to honey uh, i mean uh, i would be interested to hear any other experience but so far uh, there's no concerns uh, about that at all uh now when i said this uh, because i i see uh, cons concerns are always towards honeybees and i think uh, too much attention is given uh, well too much attention is is given to to managed honeybees uh, and i really want to i always try to explain to beekeepers don't worry about uh, you know european hornet or i don't know some bear in, in natural habitat that will destroy your bees uh the, we to the, today we know what are the problems for honeybees it's so many things it's pesticides it's climate change and another thing we also don't want to maybe admit but it's a human factor uh, in terms we pile so many hives of honeybees on one spot they actually uh, are harmful to themselves so i think if we want to worry about honeybees i mean as a managed species we need to to really educate beekeepers on these terms like how many hives it's okay to put in one place? What are the resources that will, uh, you know, support these colonies? And I mean, of course, honeybees are not to blame. We are the ones who carry them around and put them in places. So I think, um, yeah, don't worry about Megahila sculpturalis. Uh, we need to, we need to figure out how to keep bees in a way that they don't. Uh, harm themselves because if you put too many hives in one spot they will all be hungry and i don't even want to mention solitary bees uh, i put here this one slide with these numbers that, that are just crazy uh, it says that one hive per per month uh, worker bees worker honeybees can collect as much pollen as more than thirty thousand native bee babies so Yes, just um, we need to keep thinking about resources and too many uh, honeybee hives. And I would really like to, uh, well, that's a topic for another lecture, but uh, I would really like to, to, to hear more questions like, will it affect wild honeybees? Because managed honeybees, although whoever is a beekeeper here knows, it's an unpredictable job, it's a hard job, but still people are helping them, people are translocating them, feeding them, uh, and it's totally different thing with, with other bees. So what about other native solitary bees? What, what will happen to, um, uh, when it comes to Megahila sculpturalis? The answer is totally different, but still unconclusive because um, yeah, a lot of European bees actually nest in similar cavities as Megahila sculpturalis. Um, but again, I need to stress out that we need really detailed, detailed studies uh, to measure this impact. So what we know so far that um, we know the Megahila sculpturalis visits um, different plants when it comes to, to nectar, we still are not uh, sure for, for pollen collection. I mean, there are many studies about this, but it's um, we need more studies to see how it affects larval development. Um, maybe I, I need to explain this a little bit more. Uh, bees can be, it, we call it oligolactic and polylactic. What does this mean? It means either they are generalists, like they can collect pollen from different plants, and feed their babies or not, or they are really, babies are really sensitive. They need a specific type of pollen from a specific, I don't know, plant family. So uh, we know that many bees that are actually specialists, if they, they don't have a choice, they will collect whatever, but their babies will not develop. So for Megahila sculpturalis, we have data, but we still did not do this larval development, uh, feeding them different pollens to, to know for sure. 
So for now, we know there is overlap in you know food use with with um, uh, polygole- polylactic bees that are you know collecting from different plants. What we observed, and there are studies studies published so far on this, uh, Megachilus culturalis um, is sometimes really aggressive on nesting sites. Uh, it shows aggressive behavior, uh, direct eviction from the nests from you know other bees. They they clean the nest and use them for for their babies. And also there's something uh, we recently uh, read in a paper. Uh, they can also block other bees' nests. Like if you ha- have this, I don't know, Osmia species that are uh, active in spring and they don't finish filling one hole, they just, I don't know, for some reason they filled half of the cavity and then the females died. And then you have Megachila sculpturalis in the summer that will continue filling this same cavity, and then these bees in spring cannot emerge. It's uh, it's too much for them to chew through the the resin and and uh, all the things uh, Megahila sculpturalis use. So we have this we have this direct aggression, eviction, and blocking of the net. But still, I have to emphasize, we still do not have adequate uh, uh, studies. To for sure say, okay, this this bee affected, you know, population trends of another native species, and we have to say it's invasive. So although it's been in Europe since 2008, and there are a lot of studies going on, we still don't have enough information, and we still call it potentially invasive species. We still don't call it invasive. Uh, now I want to to show you this um, um, uh, how to call it like a document that was published by IUCN in 2019. Um, it's called "Managing Invasive Alien Species to Protect Wild Pollinators," and it's kind of like a like a guidance. It sounds really important, and I was really curious to see um, is there Megachilus culturalis. In this document, what does it say? And I was really surprised. I don't want to say <laughs> disappointed, but um, look at this, for example. It says uh, there is a section about Megahila sculpturalis, and then it says uh, available management measures, and then it says prevention of new introductions. And what is the measure? Let's read it pre border treatment and biosecurity checks on wood and wood packaging. Okay, so this sounds like, okay, something we can try. I, I know uh, about Australia, they are really strict about uh, their measurements, but you know, Europe, it's, it has all these borders and, and the places wood packaging can, can enter. And then the same document, if you continue reading it, it they say uh, the effectiveness while these existing biosecurity measures will likely reduce the risk of entry, they are not specific, specifically targeted at Megahila species, and it's un- unlikely that f- further introductions will be prevented. And I have to say, in 2008, when this bee species was first detected, this measure was already in place. It was part of uh, legislative documents, and it still didn't do anything. So it's just kind of a, okay, let's put this measure and then effectiveness is zero. So what's the point? Uh, The same document also um, says a few things about secondary spread. What is secondary spread? So uh, introduction is when uh, a certain uh, species, insect or whatever we are looking at uh, is introduced in another country. And secondary spread when it spreads within this country uh, or within this continent. So the secondary spread is even more, uh, I don't want to say tricky, but it's um, like there is this also really ridiculous measure. It says restricting movement of nesting material and encouraging the planting of native tree species. Okay, 
let's think about this for a while. Uh, first of all, I'm all for uh, native, not just tree species. I'm really in favor of planting uh, native plants wherever, for whatever reason. It's uh, also a long story. Uh, we, we really should encourage this, not just because of um, uh, potentially invasive species, but because uh, it's really important for so many other reasons. But look at the look at the document now. Uh, let me just move this gallery so I can read it. So they say um, they say by themselves there are no measures that could realistically be put in place to restrict the movement of vehicles, boats, and other vectors that may carry potential nesting material. So it's really not possible. You can imagine checking every piece of moving vehicle it's really not possible uh, another thing they said uh, about um, um, japanese pagoda tree i will now explain this so okay for sure we know that uh, megahilis culturalis is really uh, like it is polylactic bee it visits different uh, plants but we know for sure, this is what we know for sure, it really prefers this, this tree, this Japanese pagoda tree called Tifnolobium japonicum. Someone calls it also Sophora trees. Whatever you want to call it, it is really widely planted in Europe. So like now to put this as a measure, like to, uh, I don't know, uh, st stakeholders, those that are responsible for public areas, should be encouraged uh, to plant native native tree species, but uh, sophoras are, are already out there everywhere, so they are already um, you know enhancing the spread of Megahilus culturalis. Um, the fortunate thing is that uh, sophora is not invasive species. It's it's um, uh, the the funny story is that it's actually not a, a Japanese uh, tree although it's called Japanese pagoda tree, it's actually from China. Uh, it's not invasive. That's a good thing. Uh, if it was invasive, I mean, Apis mellifera, honeybees are re really like this tree. So yeah, Megahilus culturalis wouldn't uh, uh, change anything since it's full of honeybees uh, every summer. So what I want to say is Sephoras are already there. We should focus of, on, on planting native trees for so many reasons. But it, it's not a measure to stop this bee for, from spreading. It's, re it's really not. And what I want to say is that um, Megahilus culturalis, it's, it's, here to, it's here. It's established. It's here to stay. And we should really focus not on stop the, inter stop the introductions, stop the spread, don't plant this tree. No, we, we, it's too late for that. We need to focus on other things. Like, okay, let's measure what it's doing. Let's help native species in different ways. Let's see if there is, and this is really important, is there a plant that is invasive and Megahilus culturalis will potentially pollinate it and you know enhance its spread? This is the things we, we should really uh, focus on. So, so to like, to conclude, and I'm not done yet, I just want to co conclude this part, we, we really need more data. And this is where citizen science comes into place, really. Uh, and I, ever since I started um, involving citizens, I, I realized more and more how, how amazing this approach is. And I really recommend anybody who studies any kind of uh, organisms um, to include citizens. Uh, there's this illustration, the, one of my favorite illustrations, that says everything in one picture, what is citizen science? Here it is. But I want to stress out that it's not only that science benefits, like science says, we need help, citizens help. No, it's the other way around also. A scientist, in order to have a successful citizen science project, they need to give back, they need to educate, to be there to people. And I think this is like the, the huge part of any citizen science project. So 
Yeah, just uh, briefly, yeah, this is what I already said, what citizen science, it's when citizens you know, participate in scientific research, they're uh, involved in many different ways, and they're also, um, all these activities are carried out in a collaboration with scientists, it's not by themselves, right? So when we first started, um, um, when we first noticed this, this Megahelios culturalis, this new, new bee for our bee fauna, um, we uh, designed these posters, flyers, um, uh, and called people to help us. We didn't know what will happen because Serbia is not really famous for citizen science projects. I don't think people even heard about this, this approach before. So, but I was surprised, I was amazed. I was totally, I don't know what to say. I was really surprised how people reacted and everybody wanted to help. Uh, yeah, before I, I go further to these, these examples, how citizen science is great, um yeah let let me show you like just a few examples uh for example in 2020 uh there was this um fruit grower from bosnia and herzegovina which is a neighboring country to serbia he actually called me to stay and you know tell his story uh he was applying uh, to his fruits he was applying this uh grafting wax it's like artificial thing you put to, to protect um, uh, where you had to cut the branch, or, or etc. So he told me, I come tomorrow and there there's no grafting wax uh, on it. Something scratched it. What, what's going on? And then he really was determined to find out who is stealing this grafting wax. And he told me that he stayed there for two or three hours. And then he spotted this huge, dark insect as he explained he took a photo of it he uh, searched he used google to, to to try to find what is it he never saw it before and he found actually our website where we explained what is it uh, where did it come from what to do if anybody noticed it and this is how uh, he he ended up calling me and i was amazed like I, the, uh, in all literature there is about this bee, there is not even one piece of information saying this, that this bee actually recognized this grafting wax as a suitable material for its nest. And the, the, the sculptured resin bee is actually the name of it, it comes from uh, the fact that this bee collects resin, that sticky material, and lines its nest. So this bee, you know, recognized this um, this thing and yeah we wouldn't know any anything about it if there wasn't this this person who was really determined to to be there and see what's going on so us as scientists yeah this this, this discovery is not possible you know without help of people another example i, wa I wanted to share is um it was actually in 2022 it was a peak uh, season of uh, Sephora flowering. And I had a friend who was traveling through Greece with a, with a bus. And she told me, I saw these trees you're looking for. I saw them, they're in full bloom in Greece. And I asked if she could get out of the bus, look at the canopies, tell me if there are Megahelios sculpturalis, because at that time uh, there was no findings in Greece. It would be, you know, a first finding. And then she couldn't leave the bus. It, uh, it was a complicated story. So, you know, I really wanted just to pack my things and go to, to this place. She explained where she saw them. Of course, I couldn't. And then what I decided to do, just to try it, I, I decided to, you know, go live on my Instagram account and, yeah, tell, like, okay, if there is anyone... Uh, at the moment in Stavros, Greece, or maybe you are planning to go there in five or seven days, please, could you go to this and this street? To There is this cafe and a bakery. I explained exactly where it is. Uh, if you are willing to just observe the canopies for 10 minutes and let me know what you see. I, I didn't even realize what will happen next. Uh, there was like four or five families 
that called me uh, through Instagram and told me they are there and they're willing, you know, to, to take the time from their own vacations. They are there with their families, with their kids, and to go and look at these trees for me. And they're not, it's not like they're my friends, you know, they want to, to do this for me. It's just people that follow my Instagram page. I was so amazed uh, with this. I really, really did not expect it. Uh, and thanks to, to their efforts, I was really able to get this, uh, you know, real time, reliable information on the ground without having to, to go to Stavros myself. I think this is uh, amazing. It's really amazing. And another example I want to show you, uh, this is actually uh, a photo from a family from Belgrade. They had this nest uh, on their balcony where, where they spotted uh, female Megahila sculpturalis. And they told me about it. They saw this, on uh, I don't know, Instagram, Facebook. They reported it. We stayed in touch. And actually next, a year this was in 2020 and next year and every other year since uh they went uh you know a step further from from this you know just reporting i called these people super citizen scientists because this was totally their initiative what they do they build these these boxes uh, on one side there is like a glass material they can take photos of the bees on, on one side, there's like a mesh material bees can breed, and they were they were able to uh, not only tell me how many individuals emerged from a nest when they started the activity period, but but also like how many individuals per day it, was it a male or a female? Like this is something I would never be able to to do by myself. I mean, of course, we can have observational nests and stuff, but it takes a lot of time. To do this so yeah th th this is just a few few examples how citizen science can be, be amazing and really helpful it's not just oh it's a funny story it's really scientific sound data uh, yeah i also want to mention uh, because i uh, keep uh, bringing up serbia uh, there is a lot of other uh, organizations that um, uh, and scientists that collect data about this bee. Uh, this is one of them, Bee Raider. Um, actually, the, the colleague who leads this uh, project, uh, uh, Julia Laner, she really helped me because she started her, her uh, citizen science project uh, years before me. And I was really new in this citizen science thing. And she really helped me with her experience, um, gave me a lot of advice how to deal with people, how to explain things and stuff. Uh, there are also a few projects uh, in Italy, in France. And yeah, if uh, yeah, th this is like um, my call to everybody who is listening to this or uh, watching this uh, lecture or later in, on YouTube. Uh, if you notice this bee, uh, pay attention during July and August every year. Take a photo, take a video and, and let us know. So, yeah, to, to try to conclude, because one of the, the, the questions um, I wanted to address was, how do we monitor this bee? How, how can people help? So this is what I want to say. It's like to, to, we really want to accurate, accurately uh, uh, assess the impact of this new bee on native European bees and not just bees, any other creatures and ecosystems, right? So we really don't want to jump into any conclusions. We really want to assess it and call it, is it invasive or not? And for this, we need more data. And uh, for example, what kind of data? We need like, um, if you have a nesting spot where other bees are coming and you notice uh, Megahila sculpturalis, it's a perfect spot because then we can, you can observe the behavior, the nesting patterns and everything that that's going on. This is this is like really beyond the the capabilities of scientists alone. There there's not enough of us to to do this. Also, uh, if we want to understand the ecology and bionomy of any bee species, we, it's really uh, crucial to determine the 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 list of plants that this 
bee species feeds on, and on the other hand, which they potentially pollinate, which I already explained why why it's important, uh, especially think about invasive plants. What will happen if, if there's a combination of this bee and this invasive plant? When they come together, we will have much bigger problem than just, you know, aggressive behavior on a nesting spot for solitary bees. So, uh, yeah, one of the one of the the the, the topics here was the beekeepers, the citizen scientists. Beekeepers are actually really good citizen scientists. Uh, first of all, many beekeepers really feel the nature. And they spend a lot of time outdoors, you know, observing uh, nature around them. This is what we need. And of course, they, they have this common interest, you know, in flying in insects. And uh, most beekeepers have a really uh, fair understanding of environmental processes, of plant, bee networks, etc. Also, what we found when we were collecting samples uh, of this bee for DNA analysis, uh, most beekeepers are really not afraid to, you know, to catch this bee and send us specimens. Um, most other people would be afraid, right? Which is totally normal. And also beekeepers know a lot of things about plants more than an average person. So they, they uh, during last years, they really provided valuable information on, on plant bee interactions, which was really important. And it, it continues to be important. Um, yeah, I want also to tell you when I'm always um, mentioning plants, I want to tell you um, about monitoring in Belgrade, how we do it, just in short. Uh, first of all, there was this really unique situation in Belgrade, how we first spotted, spotted this bee and came up with this monitoring uh, uh, protocol. Uh, actually, I want to tell you that the uh, initial phase of any colonization of any introduction is really hard to detect. Why? Because initial phases are always connected with low number of individuals, right? So it's not really easy to spot them. So th this is what happened to us also. We accidentally saw this, in, it was in 2017, we saw one male of Megahila sculpturalis in the center of Belgrade. We know what it was. Uh, we we knew what it feeds on. We try to find it everywhere. We we looked for Sephoras in Belgrade. We found them. They were blooming. Nothing. We couldn't spot them. And it was for 2017 and 18, like this. And then what happened in 2019? It's something that it's not really surprising. It's common in many tree trees. Uh, Sephoras actually sometimes keep blooming. They're fine, they're alive, they're green, they're growing, but they just don't bloom for some reason that that's completely normal. And this is what happened in 2019. We had all these Sephora, Belgrade is full of Sephoras. All these Sephoras that did not bloom and just few trees bloomed. And all Megahelis sculpturalis individuals gathered on these few trees. We call this concentration effect, and it was really easy to spot them, to count them, to, to do any sort of uh, uh, assessment. So if you have this situation, this is what happened to us. Um, what actually we do um, on, in field work when we go to uh, just uh, observe and count the bees and see what's going on, because we really want to know, is the population growing, what's going on? Uh, first of all, we know all the location with the Sephora trees. We go there, count the trees, then uh, we count the number of trees that are actually in bloom on a particular year, uh, because it's not the same every year. Also, there are Sephoras that are really huge and that are really small. It's not the same. So there are this, this there is this protocol. I'm just sh shortly explaining it here. Uh, there is this protocol how to estimate uh, floral resources for this bee. So this is the first step. We need to estimate what this bee has to feed on. So count the trees, count the trees that are in bloom, see the size of the canopies, and then assess, sometimes not the whole canopy blooms. 
sometimes it's only one branch. So we also take this into account. And there are two ways of counting bees, depending on if it's uh, if there are really a lot of bees at the moment, then we do snapshot counts. Uh, if there's only a few or you see only one, we do timed counts. I don't want to go into many details because um, it's, it's not that complicated, but um, uh, we publish the detailed protocol, how we do it um, in this paper. Uh, and it, why is this important? Because we, if we do it the, in the same way in different countries, we can compare results. So if everybody does the same thing, this is why it's called protocol, uh, we can compare the numbers, we can compare the, what's going on with, with this um, population. So if you are uh, interested to find uh, out uh, more on this, um, yeah, this, this is open uh, access uh, uh, journal, open access uh, article, you can download it and, and read it. And now to, to conclude, like the, the final thing I really want to, to stress out is uh, can this, our research protocol or e everything I, I talked about tonight, like this citizen science involvement, can it be applicable for other invasive species such as uh, Asian yellow legged hornet, Vespa galutina, which is a hot topic at the moment. And definitely, yes, like for me, the city, like, Okay, you cannot involve citizens in monitoring just any species. If it's some cryptic, small, hiding, not easy to recognize, of course, it's not that easy. But if it's a really distinctive looking uh, species, like Vespa velutina or Megahila sculpturalis, that you can easily recognize from the photo, it's a perfect subject for, for citizen science, really. Like, sit, like, I already mentioned this. Citizen science uh, can can give us uh, so many answers. First of all, we can cover larger areas in shorter period of time. We can have, you know, insights into some phenomena that would otherwise be overlooked. Like I give you examples: this this grafting wax, wax or other things we would not know without people. And also, what's important. Uh, Citizen science actually gives us access to private land that's not accessible, you know? You cannot go to someone's yard or backyard or land and, you know, do a research. So it's it's really important to, when it comes to potentially invasive species to include people. Of course, uh, I want to stress this over and over again. It's not just we are asking for your help, please give us information. No, it's two-way street. You need to provide information. There are so many times I answer questions, uh, a lot of biology questions to people because I, I really am happy when people are interested in, in nature in general. So it's, it's a two-way street. It sometimes takes a lot of time, but still it saves a lot of time at the same time. Uh, I like to say that especially today, when uh, there's misinformation everywhere, you know, fake news, conspiracy theories, I think it's really essential to connect with the public, to provide them with, you know, verified information and also feedback. What What is happening with their information they provided? How we will use it? Where we will publish? What, what are the conclusions? People want to know, just, just include them. So, um, yes, this is uh, what I al already said. If it's a recognizable for species, it's a perfect subject, top, perfect object, sorry, not a subject, perfect object for, for citizen science. And uh, as we know, Vespa velutina in many countries was spotted by beekeepers. Uh, there is this uh, paper from August. Uh, we now know that uh, Vespa velutina is... Um, uh, spotted in Hungary, and a beekeeper spotted it. So, yes, I think uh, if scientists do their part, like um, do the education part, and not only when some species already occurs, we need to do it in advance. So we need to, uh, you know, tell people what to expect, what is this insect, is it dangerous, we don't want any 
you know, panics or, or anything. We don't know people. We don't, we really don't want, especially when Vespa Valutina is uh, a case, we don't want people go there and try to, to solve it by themselves. So they need to have information, who to call, what to do if they spot. Uh, and this is easily done. Just make a website, uh, use traditional media, use social media, spread the word. Uh, and this is something that every country should do when there is a species that is expected to, to occur in their country. So with this, um, yes, I would, uh, I, I hope I did not exceed my time. Uh, thank you for your attention. I would really like um, to discuss some more. If you have any questions, uh, I would like to hear them. That's great, Yovana. Thanks very much. I'm particularly impressed with the Instagram Live. I've never used that before, so that's uh, obviously something uh, to, to try. Um, there is a question from Anya. She asked uh, if you could explain uh, pollination chain break. Mm -hmm. Yes, this is important. Like, um, uh, if you have this this um, this network, this this uh, I don't know how to say it, like a connection between pollinators and plants and you have this ecosystem everything is in balance then if you introduce you don't have to introduce an insect like i explained here you can introduce uh, another plant uh, it disrupts this this balance and we have many examples for example people like to plant lavender right everybody likes lavender it looks great it smells great but there are studies saying that uh, showing, not saying, that lavender actually uh, really attracts pollinators. So they don't go to, you know, to native plants, they go to lavender. So it's just really disrupted. I don't know how else to explain it uh, and to, to be clear. So any, any disruption has its consequences. So... To, to go back to normal, it's, it's not that easy. So this is okay. why I really like uh, native plants to, and, and when I say native plants, you need to do the research. It's not like there are list, lists of pollinator friendly plants all over internet, but you cannot, if you, I don't know, live in South Europe, you cannot take the list from England. It's different. So do the research. What are the plants native to your area? If you want to support pollinators, just plant, plant those and you cannot go wrong. Okay. I hope, uh, Anya, that, that, that Yovana has answered your question sufficiently. Um, I found one in a, of your comments about, you know, knowing who to contact in regards to these uh, non-Indigenous uh, species. So here in Luxembourg, the, uh, the Natural History Museum is using the iNaturalist app and... Uh, through the iNaturalist uh, smartphone app, if uh, people take photo and upload the photo to iNaturalist, then the museum is uh, reporting uh, these uh, non-Indigenous species to the relevant authorities. So they're using that as a tool. But um, I realize that Serbia is not yet in the European Union, but it, do you know if there's some kind of... Uh, you know, common platform that is used within uh, in Europe, for example, because, for example, in the UK, they seem to be using, I believe that they're using a tool called the iRecord uh, rather than a naturalist. So there seems to be, you know, uh, different tools, perhaps in different countries. And therefore, um, I don't know if that's advantageous or a disadvantage in, uh, in the way that uh, these non-Indigenous species are potentially reported. Yes, that, that's an interesting question because I uh, keep going back to the same the same thing. I really would like if we had only one, uh, you know, mobile phone app that everybody would report. And I realize it's not the case. Like you said, in some countries, some um, apps are, I don't know, more popular for some reason, um, which is also okay. Like we have uh, GBIF that, you know, collect all the data in one spot, but still, uh, for, for Serbia, I know for sure the people are not used to do this. They're not really willing to download any apps. So uh, this is also what we had to think about when we started our citizen science project. Like, 
my colleague Yulia that I mentioned, she was surprised that we still use Facebook. It's like this archaic whatever. And uh, when I did this, the statistics of people who reported Megahiloscopes rallies, and I asked them, where did you see our call? Most of them were from, uh, they saw it on Facebook. So you need to really do the research. What is your target audience? What are they looking at? What do they want to do? Like, I know for sure that in Serbia, people are not, um, uh, there are reasons for that, but people don't like to download anything on their phones. So they would rather just call me. You know, I gave my phone number and asked if they can share photos via email or WhatsApp or I don't know why, but no, they called me, especially if they're older people. So I don't want to exclude anyone. I want everybody's eyes to, to be on this. So this is one of the things you really need to uh, research before you start anything. Where are you going to talk to? What's your audience? How to talk to them? What to offer them? What is uh, okay for them to use? That's great. Um, so as I said in my introduction, um, the the resin the sculptured resin bee is about 160 kilometers or 100 miles from the Luxembourg borders. Just as an example, do we have any idea of of how quickly it progresses? I don't know per annum. So, for example, making the link with your other comment about education and educating people or educating I don't know if it's just uh, researchers and scientists or also the public about the, the potential arrival, for example, of the sculptured resin bee in Luxembourg. So, you know, is there a certain um, sort of average progression rate that we might be able to use to predict when it might arrive? Yes, it, of course, it depends of the, you know, geographical barriers. Uh, what we know so far, it's a, uh, first of all, it's a huge bee, so it can fly uh, really far. This is what we know about bees. The smallest they are, the shorter distances they, they can fly. Uh, this bee is huge, it's strong. We have it in certain islands in Europe. So, um, like, only high mountains are kind of slowing it down. But we have it on both sides of the Alps. So, And you're right, it's still not recorded in Luxembourg, but uh, uh, there it is in some German cities that are of the same latitude. So it's really expected to, to, I'm sure it will arrive. Uh, we know for, for Serbia, uh, north part of the Serbia, it's only plains with a lot of sephoras planted. So it just spread in, in two years, it was everywhere. So I, I'm not able to tell you from the top of my head, like how many kilometers per year, but we know for sure in a year, it can go to 200, 300 kilometers, depending, of course, on the um, geographical barriers. If yeah, there's, there's not many. There's not many mountains around Luxembourg. May, maybe she's already there. <laughs> yeah, maybe. Yeah. In regards to the Asian hornet, um, people have been talking about using traps uh, to for the partic particularly for the queens as they emerge from winter hibernation. Um, obviously, some of these traps are, are very damaging to our native wild pollinators in that the traps are indiscriminate in what pollinators they catch, and therefore there's a lot of collateral damage in these traps. Um, I don't know if you have any any information on, on potential effective measures. There was some discussion, for example, about using pheromones uh, as a potential lure uh, for the, I don't know if it's for the males or... Yes, it's it's really important to talk about this because if you put uh, traps that will attract, you know, worker of Vespa Velutina, you will not do anything. You need queens. So I think this is where citizen science can have its role because for Vespa Velutina, we know that initial nest, it's usually close to the ground. It can be easily visible to people and it's just starting. So this is the phase you want to catch. Because when you destroy this phase, it's uh, later, like month month later, it moves to higher uh, uh, parts of the tree or whatever uh, it finds, and then they're numerous, and it's really hard to 
to to reach them, even if you know where the nest is. So I think, uh, yeah, citizen science, when it comes to this, this is uh, what we can explain to people. They can understand this. Look for this nest, look for this insect, and call immediately. So, yeah, I also read about a lot of uh, pheromone-based traps and stuff. This is something that, uh, yeah, it's worth of exploring. Uh, and I'm not in favor of this uh, wide trap that will trap everything that moves because I don't think it's really effective and it's doing more harm than 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 good. So there's a couple of questions from uh, Anya. Are the solitary bees invasive and dangerous? I assume she's uh, speaking about the resin, the sculptured resin bee. The yes, this is one of the questions I also uh, get a lot because. Uh, when when people ask are they dangerous, they usually think are they dangerous to humans. I presume Anya meant to, to, to ask this uh, because it's really huge. It looks scary, but it's actually not. As all other solitary bee species, uh, uh, I mean solitary insects in general, they they don't have this instinct to defend their nests. They they really don't pay any attention to to people or animals. Uh, of course, females can sting you. They have stingers. They can sting you multiple times, uh, unlike um, worker honeybees. But they will only sting you if you really like catch it with your hand, bare hands, which I'm, I presume you will not even try to do. And also, their sting is not dangerous. There are no uh, allergic reactions to it. This is maybe interesting to people to know. Uh, us humans develop the allergic reactions to hornets to some wasps and to honeybees so even if it stings you it will only be like a, a located um, swelling and no no not a big deal so for humans and or animals um, they're not a real danger they don't defend their nest they don't attack and uh, yes for for native bees is we still need to collect more data like i said we observe direct aggression, there are negative um, behaviors that these bees show, but we still don't know if it really affects native bees or not, or it's just another thing that affects them and they still survive. Okay. Uh, Anya has another question. Where in Vojvodina are the Sophora trees? In Vojvodina, yes, that's the north uh, part of Serbia I mentioned. Uh, eh, like we, if we receive a call from someone and they spotted the Megahila sculpturalis, usually they spot it on this tree because where where would you look for a bee? You you will look for it on um, plant species that feed that visits, right? So uh, like I wouldn't want to say hundred percent, but ninety percent of all observations we received from people was um, on on Sephora trees. So even um, when I went on field work to follow up to see to maybe collect samples, but oh, seems like Giovanna's we've Person lost Giovanna. Uh, mm, Giovanna, you, jo Giovanna, can you repeat yes, uh, yes. that last sentence or two? Because uh, we lost you there sure. for a minute. Yes, maybe. Um, is my can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, so uh, when I was driving, driving through Vojvodina to go to the place where I received the observation call, uh, everywhere I, I drive through, there are Sephoras. So in every small city, big city, uh, town, the Sephoras are planted everywhere. It's uh, one of the favorite beekeeping uh, beekeepers um, trees in Serbia because it blooms in summer when not a lot of... Um, trees or or flowers are, are in bloom ah so it's at the beginning of spring then no it's actually in uh, in summer i uh, beg your pardon Sorry. okay Th this is this is why it's very popular in be with beekeepers because in spring you have a lot of uh, flowers not just trees a lot of different flowers but in summer it's not the case so they really like this tree and not only beekeepers, uh, it's really good for urban environments. So it was 
uh, last hundred years it was planted all over the, the, the Serbia. And I know this as a fact for other European countries, uh, that it's really popular tree. So yeah, I'm not sure. Tree, I'm yeah. not sure if we have them in Luxembourg, but maybe maybe it's too cold. I'm not sure. I know for Vienna there's a lot, uh, so it's a popular tree. Just look for a blooming tree in in July and August. It's it's Sophora. And then we have a question from Marina, who's asking where in what parts of Bosnia the resin bee is mm -hmm. located. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't have a lot of information for Bosnia, uh, but uh, we have few spots like uh, Banja Luka, Bielina, a little bit to the south. Uh, there are observations. So for Bosnia, we still did not cover the whole area, but uh, it's for sure present. Anyone else have some questions? One of the things that I find it, find difficult is that, okay, we're talking about, or you were talking about native versus non-native uh, species. And, you know, at some point, uh, I, I'm not a scientist by, by training or a profession, but I assume at some point we have to say that the species is established and and maybe there, I don't know to what extent we're able to do any kind of uh, control anymore. It, it, you know, there must be a point where it's it's fruitless. The results, you know, Asian hornet being an example. So, you know, I haven't seen it myself in Luxembourg, although, as I said, it's been the nests have, are present as of 2022. But when I go on holiday in France and Spain, for example, I see them quite frequently. And therefore, it seems to me that, you know, at some point, you know, the species will just be established and that will just be a fact of life. And therefore, you know, can we really say, I mean, OK, it's non-native by the definition, your definition, that it's been introduced by human activity. But at some point, it becomes a species that's in the, the landscape and we just have to live with it. Yes, yes, I see. What, I totally agree with you. Uh, we need to like weigh how much money do we invest in eradicating some species, uh, and what what is the gain? Um, I mean, I read a lot about these methods. They, in, especially in Italy, they use for Vespa velutina. It's amazing, uh, and I think it, that's the reason we still don't have it <laughs> in Serbia because of their efforts. But still, um, yes, you're right. This is this is the reality. At one point, we need to say, okay, this is it. Let's see. We cannot eradicate it. We cannot stop it from spreading. Let's see what else we can do. When it comes to bees, I think it's important to really see what I mentioned. Is there an invasive plant that maybe it's not uh, already spread that much? This is what we can target. We can more easily eradicate the plant than the insect. For Vespa velutina, we know it, it has a negative impact on beekeeping uh, and on, on people when they try to remove the nest by themselves. I think we need to tell people more and more, don't do it yourself. This is when they become dangerous, when you try to remove the nest by yourself. Don't do it and just provide resources or nest removal if it's in a place that really bothers people this is what we can do thank you anyone else any more questions out there are the solitary are, there, are the solitary bees invasive in serbia and generally do they make honey Maybe the question is, do the Megahila sculpturalis make honey? I'm not sure. Yes, I assume. Yes, this is also one of the questions I received a lot when I say there is this new bee, it comes from Asia. Everybody asks, oh, what, what's the honey like? And this is because, and I think this is not unique for Serbia. A lot of people just, when you say, when you say a word bee, it automatically, your brain goes to honeybees and honey. 
so no it doesn't make honey it lives totally different it doesn't have any uh, need to make honey we know that honeybees make honey in order to survive the winter and most solitary bees just die off before winter uh, how do they manage to to you know have the continuous of life because uh, their their babies survive right this is totally different uh, solution to uh, uh, to you know in evolution this is two different solutions there's not thing better or worse it's just different so solitary bees do not make honey they adults um, after reproduction they lay uh, females lay eggs prepare the nests and they they just die off and the babies are the ones who will continue to live okay so if there aren't any more questions then i would really like to thank you yovana for a very interesting discussion uh, about these invasive alien species and i'm particularly encouraged by the use of citizen scientists in uh, in your projects and this is uh, obviously a, a a challenge here in luxembourg as well for some of the projects i'm involved with so thanks very much for being our guest this evening on the bees without borders conference series and uh, to thank you on behalf of free the bees apis arborea the natural beekeeping trust and honeybee wild here in luxembourg and of course thank you to all the participants for uh your presence here and your engagement, uh, particularly uh, the, the questions in order to make it more interactive, that's always encouraging. And as uh, Andre said, the uh, this, this is recorded and it will be available on YouTube at some point soon. So we will encourage you to share that with your colleagues and uh, other contacts that you might have that are interested in these invasive alien species and non-invasive species. Thanks again. And we hope to see you again at a future event. Thank you. Thank you. And good luck, Yvonne. <laughs>